but Odin is so flawed. Because if you read the Poetic Edda, he's not perfect in any way. In fact, sometimes he can be um, downright, you know, um, mischievous. You know, he, he really wants to acquire wisdom, and he's going to do whatever it takes to get there. Um, and, and, and in certain ways, he embodies madness as well, because it's the opposite of wisdom. The more wisdom you gain, often the more lonely you become, because you realize these universal truths that not everyone realizes. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for June 15th through the 21st, 2020. And today on the show, we will be speaking with Jacob. Jacob is a Norse pagan who has a wonderful YouTube channel called The Wisdom of Odin. So we are really excited to share our interview with Jacob with you guys. But before we do, we need to talk a bit about our forecast that we did last week because we got the Eight of Cups, a pretty kind of depressing and disappointing card of the week. How did that card play out for you, Dan? Horribly. I, <laughs> I, well, you know, I had a very unexpected change to my life out here. And um, walking away from something was definitely symbolic. And initially, I was really not happy and upset about the circumstances <laughs> But now, you know, I actually see this as an opportunity and I feel <laughs> like in the way that this year has really tested everybody, I feel less phased by these little bumps in the road. So, you know, it, it came true, the walking away thing, leaving behind things you enjoy came true. Um, I found it interesting too. A lot of people were stepping down for like accusations against them. Like the um, the New York Times person was stepping down. Somebody at Second City was stepping down, and then J.K. Rowling was being like canceled this week. So it was definitely a week of like outrage and canceling people and stuff, including us in a way. People didn't. Not everybody liked our episode last week, and some people literally walked away from us because they didn't like it so kind of a a rough week but i'm feeling good by now at least um how about you how did that play out for you yeah it's definitely been a rough week uh definitely feeling disappointed in you know how things have turned out in various areas of my life so (laughs) pretty intense and hopefully you know we get a better card this week because i think at this point you know we're all pretty exhausted from you know, so much drama and crises and, you know, everything that's going on in the world is so intense right now. And everything that seems to be going on in our personal lives too right now seems pretty intense. So Mm -hmm. I'm hoping we start to get a bit of a break. But um, Dan, as you were saying, the astrology, you know, moving into the next year, it doesn't look like things are necessarily going to be peachy for quite a while. Um, But maybe we'll get a short respite. Well, yeah, things are going to continue to get harder and harder. But like I said, I feel more resilient this year than many. So at least we've been um, tested time and time again throughout this year because round two, <laughs> act two, is going to be really crazy. Um, but I'm kind of excited. I'm excited for more chaos. <laughs> Yeah, that's very Scorpio of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so it's interesting, right? I mean, at the very least, it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, when you don't have that much to lose, you know, it can be fun to watch the world burn for sure. <laughs> when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Exactly. So, yeah, so the Eight of Cups last week, we'll have to see what new card we get coming up given the cards a couple shuffles here and yes coming from that last week's card geez hoping for something this is a big this is a big week too so astrology wise this is going to be big Mm -hmm. (laughs) so we'll see what we get okay 
So for our patrons, we just pulled the card of the week. And last week, you know, we got the Eight of Cups, which was a pretty intense and disappointing card. And this week, I would say, you know, it's slightly better. We're moving into a bit more fiery energy. But the main thing I would like to highlight is this is really a card of self-defense. We need to stay strong, maintain our position, and not let the negativity of others affect us. So those are the main points I wanted to bring out from the card of the week coming up. Though, of course, if you would like to hear what the card of the week is and its interpretation and how it will affect your week ahead, you can, of course, become part of our Patreon family. So what would you like to highlight about the astrology coming up? So this is um, a pretty active week in astrology. Um, There is um, the main thing that I have to highlight, I mean... Everyone's going to know that Mercury goes retrograde this week, so I'll just tell you now, Mercury goes retrograde this week in in Cancer on the 18th. And then we have our summer solstice solar eclipse. Um, It's happening at zero degrees Cancer on the day. I mean, technically, it depends on what time zone you're in, but it's right on top of the the summer solstice. And this is a tight eclipse that actually does black out part of the sun. It's not as it's much stronger than the lunar eclipse we had before us and it's going to be much stronger than the next lunar eclipse we have when this moon goes full in 2 weeks. So yeah, be aware that um chaotic ecliptic energy is afoot and we have to be really um you know this whole weekend uh, we're We've been through a lot in 2020, and we're entering a new portal to step up the astrology into Act 2, which is going to test us even more than Act 1 did. So um, I think this weekend would be like a good self-care weekend, a good weekend to lay low because this is volatile energy. It's a tight eclipse. It's a very powerful day of the year with high energies, the solar or the summer solstice is always that. So we're entering cancer season with this massive eclipse. And and it is the last eclipse happening on the Cancer Capricorn axis officially. Um, and it's it's very tight with the nodes. So it's, it's going to be a big one. So, um, you know, be vigilant this week and be ready for chaos. Um, and be ready to, you know, we've, we've all got this. Eclipses happen every year. Um, it's just this year in particular, it might be extra strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really intense times ahead. So, uh, thanks for listening to our shortened version of the forecast and stay tuned because we have a great interview coming up. We will be interviewing Jacob, who is a Norse pagan and the creator of the YouTube channel, Wisdom of Odin. So stay tuned. speaking with Jacob. He is the creator of a really fun YouTube channel called Wisdom of Odin, and he is a Norse pagan and speaks on his channel all about Norse pagan practices, his own experience as a Norse pagan. So we're really going to dive in deep to Norse paganism today. And if you've been listening to our show for a while, You might remember that we interviewed another Norse pagan, May Hella, who is another fellow YouTuber. So it's really great connecting with the pagan YouTubers, especially for me, since um, I have a YouTube channel as well. So 
We're really excited to talk with you today all about your channel and your goals and the work that you're doing for the Norse Pagan community. So how are you doing today, Jacob? I'm doing really good. I'm, I'm really excited to be on this podcast. It's always great to talk about this stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we usually start at uh, with some bio info on our guests. And you told us before we started recording that you are currently in Kentucky. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your upbringing sort of culturally and whether or not you were raised with religion? And then what brought you to Norse paganism? Uh, yeah, so I think what makes my story so remarkable is how unremarkable it is, because I feel like uh, my story is very similar to anyone that was born in the 90s. Like, I grew up in small Midwest Ohio, small farm town, you know, 15,000 people, um, had a very boring childhood, went to church. I went to, you know, I was in a church play at one point, and, you know, my family was Baptist, and, uh, you know, it just never connected with me. Um, and I feel like that's the story of a lot of people is that we, you know, it was just so common to go to church. That was just what people did. And, you know, I remember sitting there, I think I was 17 and my mom looked at me and she said, Hey, do you want to go get baptized? And I, I had this moment of why would I get baptized if I, if I don't feel anything? And, you know, and that was kind of it. I didn't get baptized. And then I ended up going off on my own to college, um, down here in Kentucky, actually, that's why I ended up moving to Lexington. And I uh, got my degree in art studio. Um, I practiced Buddhism, actually, for a while. Um, I was always interested in Eastern philosophy. And, uh, you know, animism first came up there and Shintoism. Um, and even, like, the religion of the, you know, green tea was a thing. Like, there's a whole religion around green tea, which is fascinating. Uh, and those things gave me some answers, but they never fully completed the picture. Um, and my family always talked about having a, a Viking ancestor. My grandfather was huge on it. And so it really started connecting with me when I was like, okay, let me explore this ancestry. And I started going down and, you know, reading the poetic at a, looking into who Odin was. And before I knew it, I had this profound religious experience, something my parents always talked about with Christianity. And yet I had it with Odin. And that was really what started my path is, you know, exploring that ancestry and just really having that that moment of enlightenment, so to speak. Yeah, I really resonate with a lot of your story there. I had a bit of a similar path where I kind of got really interested in, in Buddhism when I was in college, too, and I studied abroad in Japan, and I remember learning about the tea ceremony. I actually took a whole class on the tea ceremony. I thought it was yes. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in in a way, it's, it's interesting how many pagans, in part, were also kind of inspired by Buddhism. Um, so did you first connect with paganism then, not till after college, or I know in we're probably around the same age. So in like the, the nineties and the early two thousands, there was a lot of emphasis on like Wicca was kind of the thing. Did you ever get involved with that? Or did you kind of just go straight into Norse paganism? Um, so I need to get like a year chart cause I'm starting to lose track at my ripe old age of 26. Um, but um, I believe it was 2012. I was actually dating someone who was into Wicca and they brought up Ossetry to me because I knew I was interested um, and Vikings and the history of Vikings. Um, and they're like, why don't you do Asa True? I'm like, that sounds silly. Why would I do that? <laughs> and here I am, you know, um, I actually probably need to tell them like, whoa, you're probably right. <laughs> I should have probably gotten into it way sooner. Um, but it, it, to me, I was, I was dipped in that. Like, you know, especially when I was dating that person, it was like, I, I got little snippets of what it was like. But for the most part, I went from Christianity to Buddhism um, to uh, paganism. And I think, I think it was 2015 when I had my profound religious experience. And then it wasn't until last year, 2019, that I created the Wisdom of Odin and started becoming more public with it. So um, what was that experience like when you say you had the religious experience with Odin? Like, can you describe what that looked like for you? Um, once again, I think it was, it was so magical because it was so unremarkable where it happened. I was uh, waiting tables at a restaurant and uh, I was actually walking. I remember the booth. It was booth 24. I had two plates in my hand and I had been exploring, you know, paganism, starting to communicate with the gods and starting, you know, saying, hey, Odin, do you hear me? Are you out there? And then all of a sudden when I'm delivering these, uh, these plates to table 24, uh, it, <laughs> it just struck me. 
it was almost like falling in love in a weird way. It's the, it's the easiest way I can describe it because love is so undescribable. Um, and it just hit me all at once where I felt this rush of, you know, of emotions and love um, and confusion and just so much at once that I actually like stopped in my tracks and I almost dropped the plates I was carrying. Um, and I actually had to go outside and just sit on the wall like above the building and just kind of absorb the moment. And I just had this like, was this it? Was this what everyone talks about? Um, and why did it happen now? Why here? You know, why with these gods? It was, it was crazy. Um, and I, I, I was questioning it all the way home. <laughs> I felt like every time I questioned it, I got a different sign, like a bird was flying next to me or, you know, something just happened where it was like, this is real. <laughs> that's, that's a really good story. And I, re- I really, for some reason, relate to the fact that it happened when you were waiting tables. Because when you're, I mean, I've had experiences that sound similar to what you're talking about while driving. I mean, I've had a lot of that while driving. And I feel like if you're in that workflow or drive flow where you're like daydreaming while staying focused on something, it actually is a really good time to have like a really profound experience because you're really, your brain is in a different kind of functioning at that point. Oh, I completely agree. Especially, I mean, like today of all, you know, uh, Wardrina came out with her new song. Um, and I think I listened to it twice on the way to work. And I don't actually remember the drive to work. I'm glad I got there safe, but I just was not there. Like I was so absorbed in that song and connecting to it. Um, and I watched the music video before I got, uh, before I got there. So I just kept thinking about that mountain and uh, the meaning of that song. And uh, I completely agree. I mean, that, those drives in the car sometimes are the most profound religious experiences. Yeah, I haven't listened to that new song yet. I'm going to have to check it out after this. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so one of the questions I have for you um, is about your concept of the deities, because there's so many ways to approach it. And I know some pagans kind of view them as just archetypal energies, or some pagans kind of view them as physical beings that, you know, do interact in our day-to-day lives that do have these distinctive personalities. Where do you fall on that spectrum? Um, I would say kind of in the middle in a way, um, because I think it's so beautiful that if you remove all knowledge of religion, all knowledge of the gods, of, you know, upbringing, of really science, and you, and you saw something beautiful, if you were on the side of a cliff looking at a fjord, I feel like you would still connect to something like, you know, if you saw thunder, you would still in some way connect to it. So I think in a way, this religion, it it connects to those primal forces. And that's really what we're doing. It's just, we have a name for them and we have stories for them. Um, And in that sense, I think that's enough. If that's what you connect to, great. I think that's beautiful. Um, But with me personally, I've had so many personal interactions with the gods where it's like, I recognize, oh, I just talked to Odin or, oh, that's Thor over there. Or that, you know, that tricky Loki is over there, you know, messing with me. And I feel like I, those names have meaning. And I feel like I've connected to those on such a personal level that to me, the gods are individual beings. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I am kind of at where you are there, where I kind of feel myself kind of in the middle. Sometimes I vacillate back and forth. <laughs> between, you know, sometimes thinking, oh, these are just kind of universal energies that are expressed in through different deities in different ways and different cultures. And then there's sometimes where I kind of really do feel the presence of a specific deity, <laughs> you know, almost that they're there with me. So yeah, I definitely connect with that idea that kind of being somewhere in the middle there. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely. And One of the things I wanted to ask you too, because it's something, you know, I'm personally a little confused on too, even though I've like read blog posts and everything like that. There are different terms for like Norse pagans. Like you can go by a Norse pagan, um, which you do and and kind of I do to a certain extent too. But then some people go with saying, you know, I'm an Asatror or Asatru is my religion. And then some people just say heathen, heathenism. Um, So is there a reason you choose the term Norse pagan specifically to describe yourself? Um, yeah, I've actually, I've been meaning to make a video about this for a while. And it's just, it's such a complicated subject because everyone does have a different answer. Um, and I say Norse pagan because I feel like it's clinical. You know, there's nothing that says, you know, it's just saying that, hey, I believe in multiple gods. 
and I believe that they're from the north, and I believe they're from Scandinavia. It's very clinical, and I, that way I feel like it, it doesn't put any kind of viewpoint, because I feel like heathen tends to be used in more of an aggressive way, and, you know, I just feel like, I don't know, when someone says, I'm a heathen, they're in really invoking the Viking spirit, and Norse pagan calls us something before the Viking age, in my opinion, um, and I think with Asatru, with it being such a modern term, um, coming from Iceland, I think it's something that we'll see it as a, as a more... I guess, government official, like with this is called something to the government, it's probably going to be also true. Cause I feel like that's something that really encapsulate, encapsulates everything. And not to mention that Iceland has already done it. So I just feel like that's going to be the natural term to go to. Um, I, I will also add that I found naturally just in my conversations when I talk to people, I find myself referring to it as the old ways or the old path more frequently. Cause I feel like that's more mystical. Um, and if, you know, if you watch Jackson Crawford, you know, he talks about what they would have called it back in pre-Christian era times in Scandinavia, most likely it was just called the old ways or the way, because it really wasn't seen as a religion, more of just a cultural heritage thing. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm curious too, Jacob, um, I guess for, pe for myself and for maybe some people that are listening, like your channel is called the wisdom of Odin. Like who is Odin <laughs> and what is his wisdom? Because honestly, it's not quite the same as like the Greek pantheon, you know, where most Americans might be familiar with like basic Greek mythology. A lot of us are not familiar with basic, um, like Viking or Norse mythology. So what is special about Odin? Um, so I think what's special about Odin, this is a good question. Um, it's something I don't think I've been asked before. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and I think with Odin, what makes him special is that he's so flawed. You know, I feel like in, in so many other religions, the main God, the main deity is seen as something as, uh, an unobtainable thing where they're so much higher than us. But Odin is so flawed because if you read the poetic Edda, he's not perfect in any way. In fact, sometimes he can be uh, downright, you know, uh, mischievous. You know, he, he really wants to acquire wisdom and he's going to do whatever it takes to get there. Um, and, and, and in certain ways, he embodies madness as well because it's the opposite of wisdom. The more wisdom you gain, often the more lonely you become because you realize these universal truths that not everyone realizes. Um, and he's not the God for everyone. And that's something I, I, I really try to hammer home with people that when you come to this path, Odin shouldn't be the first God you go to. It should be someone like Thor, because Thor represents more of what everyone should be. Thor is a good, honorable deity. He re resembles strength and home and family. Whereas Odin really is just for certain people. You know, that madness is, is such a all-consuming thing that if you really don't know what you're playing with, it really can consume you. So he's like a, a seeker of wisdom. Do you think that fits with like a like a wizard archetype or it, I mean, it seems a little more f fierce. I, I I'm just really trying to like explore this branch of archetypes. Cause I feel like it's there. We know it. Like it's all in the collective unconscious. We know these things, but I'm like, there's like a little bit of a distance between me and the actual archetype, I guess. Um, so I think the best thing to go to, it's not a perfect example, but, um, Gandalf and Lord of the Rings is really heavily based off Odin. I mean, down to the look, because Odin's described as having, you know, a gray robe and a wide brimmed hat. And that's the first image we give of Gandalf, especially in the movies. Uh, but even in the books, that's how he's described. And I feel like Gandalf does a really darn good job of resembling Odin because he wanders throughout the land. He, you know, he gathers knowledge. He, you know, he helps others. But at the same time, he still has a purpose. And he's always trying to stop something or help something. Um, and even, and when he needs to, he becomes that warrior and, and Odin really is the wanderer and the warrior put together. Um, and you really have to accept both sides of that. Yeah. Cause I mean, when you were describing it earlier, that like lust for knowledge, I mean, anybody that's into the esoteric, I think can relate to that a little bit because it's like what, what you don't know can't hurt you. And most people around you do not have that lust for knowledge or that like really hard drive to like know the truth or seek the truth. 
it it's not really practical all the time and it is isolating and and lonely so that it's i'm thinking that that odin sounds like kind of like a hero a flawed hero that is in that same boat yeah 100 percent um you know i'm trying to think of a really good um if if you ever read one poetic edda ever one poem inside of the poetic edda the have them all is the poem to go to um a lot of people look at the volus because it talks about ragnarok it's big it's fancy it's fiery it talks about death but the have them all is so simple because it's just Odin describing wisdom and what wisdom is. And, and he gives knowledge to you. Um, and it's one of the oldest poems we know of. I mean, it was one of those that was passed down orally until it was written down. Um, and one of the things it says is um, it's better to be moderately wise, not too wise. Um, and I, I really take to that because it's like, look, if you just want to be happy, just be moderately wise. Be aware of the world, but don't, go, don't dive off the deep end. Uh, you know, it's very cautious about that. But then it does give advice like, look, you know, wisdom is the best thing you can carry with you when you're on the road, because it's going to help you in so many different situations. Yeah. And coming from like a, the perspective of a tarot reader, I think the archetype that Odin represents is really prominent in the two cards of the hanged man and the hermit, because it's such like a powerful concept and energy and archetype that Odin represents to me in my view. So you have like the hermit as the most obvious, you know, like you were saying Gandalf, right? It's the perfect example of that, the old man who wanders in pursuit of knowledge. But then you also have the hanged man who, like Odin, hangs upside down. Um, So that card's tied into the idea of sacrifice, the need to sacrifice to attain wisdom um, to attain enlightenment, which is very much tied to the the myth of of Odin. So I think there's like something about Odin that's really deep and is connected in an occult perspective with so many other things like tarot and probably astrology. <laughs> like Dan would know better than I would from the astrology perspective, where it is this very complex figure. Um, and that's what makes to in my view, Norse paganism very different than something like the Greek pantheon, where you have different deities for war and knowledge, you know, Um, but in Norse paganism, it's one and the same. (laughs) Right. You know, so the warrior is the scholar, um, which, in fact, is very Buddhist when you think about it. The the warrior scholar archetype um, does have a lot of relevance to um, Chinese and Japanese uh, history. So it's kind of neat that, that you would resonate with Odin so much and you kind of got your start in a, a Buddhism, which does also have stories of that warrior scholar archetype idea. Um, but yeah, I didn't have a question there, just some, some neat thoughts that came yeah. to my mind. Well, you know, if, to add on to that, you know, two little tidbits of information. One, which is, you know, it was written by Snorri Sturluson, which if you know anything about the prose that it's very, it was written by him. And it, it's hard to really take it seriously because it was written so long after the Viking Age and he was so influenced by Christianity. But there is one thing that he says which is very interesting, and that's that Odin came from the East in ancient times. And so in a way you're like, wait, so how far East are we talking? Are we talking Russia? Or did Odin come from Mongolia and China and carry that with him? Um, it's so hard to trace that, but it's an interesting concept. Um, and that leads into the second thing, which is... Um, this comes from uh, the Asa uh, true in Iceland. Um, and that's, they're, they're very big on don't look at paganism or Asa true in the terms of monotheism or in the terms of the Abrahamic religion. Look at it in the terms of animism and Shintoism. And once you change that perspective, it opens up a whole new pathway of understanding what this faith really is. Yeah, I could see the animism fitting in with it because, I mean... Do does Norse paganism have um I don't know like a code or a type of like ten commandments or anything like that that or is it kind of just like do what thou will? <laughs> um, so that was more like you can look at the have them all because the have them all is almost like uh, proverbs or psalms in a way where it just instills knowledge. Um, and yes, you could live your life by that and probably be pretty happy, but there really isn't a ten commandments per se. And, but at least not one that pers- uh, survived in any way. But culturally, we know that the Norse were really big into honor and reputation. 
Um, mm -hmm. And oaths were so important. Like if you gave your word, that was your life. You would have to die by your word. And, um, and oath rings have survived through the years. And oath rings really are that symbol of once you give an oath, you are honor bound to it. And it's, it's with marriage, it's with, you know, uh, you know, blood brothers, it's with family. Um, so I think that's such a powerful element of the faith is that your word is your soul. Yeah, I think that that is a really powerful message. And one of the, the tensions I kind of feel too, as we're, you know, thinking about texts like the Havamal and, and Norse paganism in general, is that many of us, you know, we're coming from Christian childhood, <laughs> you know, or a Christian country. And um, we kind of have to fight this impulse, I think, to try and fit Norse paganism into our worldview, which has already been shaped by Christianity in a way. So we can't just take the Havamal and be like, this is, this is the new Bible. This is our text that tells us how to live. But at the same time, you know, we don't want to dismiss it. We want to be able to take that animist or Shintoistic worldview, you know, to find the spirit in in everything, but then use the Havamal without it being, um, you know, like a substitute Bible. It's so hard for me, you know, because we're so ingrained in our growing up in this country to kind of try and fit things and look at things from the perspective of one of the other monotheistic religions that are so prominent. So it's like, how do we open up as and kind of approach the world from a more animist perspective that's more in line with how the actual Norse pagans would practice? Um, but that's something I personally struggle with. I'm like, how do I remember to be animist and not just <laughs> replace my Christian worldview, but with a Norse pagan worldview. Um, yeah, no, um, one of the things uh, I, I would say top five things I get asked by people that contact me for the first time is, um, you know, I'm scared of damnation because that is so ingrained into our, you know, into our entire being at a young age where it's like, hey, if you don't do this or you don't do this right, you're going to go to hell. And that is such a hard thing to break. I mean, it's such a fear. And, you know, and I, you know, and I, I precursor this, I know many great Christian people, you know, I, my uncle is a, you know, a diehard, you know, by the book Christian, and he's the first person I told about my beliefs. And, but there, there is this, this fear that is put into our, into our souls, especially with Baptists, um, that it's hard to break away. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, look, the further you go down this path, the less you'll fear that because you realize that life isn't so black and white. It's not so, you know, absolute that, you know, death is kind of ambiguous in a way. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And that's why, like, the ancestors are so important, you know, to not just Norse paganism, but but any of the old religions, you know, really did value that connection with those that have passed on because that veil is so thin. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's not like, uh, an, you know, ending and then they go to heaven and you never see them again. It is more of like this continuous malleable, formable, you know, uh, space that you can actually interact with, which is what makes paganism so fun, <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. In part. Mm -hmm. So with your uh, practice, Jacob, like, what does it consist of? Um, are there any, does it involve like ritual or anything like that? Or how do you um, maintain relationship with those gods? Yeah, so it's um, it's one of those things that, you know, I've explored. And the thing I love about uh, my YouTube is it's really just my personal exploration into this faith. Um, and I've gained more throughout time. For a while, I had like a monthly full moon ritual. And this wasn't anything that was written down. It was just something I did and picked up where I would burn notes to the moon. And that was, it gave me at least one day a month where I was really focusing on my religious growth. Um, and then as time moved on, I, I realized I needed that less. And it became more free-flowing when I needed to talk to the gods. So like last night I felt so disconnected. Um, you know, I really felt absorbed into my work and, you know, and to all the side projects I have going on. And I was like, I need tonight to connect with the gods. And I just knew it in my soul. So I, I just went out on my porch and I lit a candle and I just sat there for like two hours and talked to Odin. Um, and for a while, you know, at first it's like, oh, you know, it kind of feels kind of silly. You know, I'm just talking in the air. You know, what would, what would someone think if they walked by me right now? But a 
half hour in, I was so engrossed to it. You couldn't, you, it was almost like Odin was right there in front of me and I couldn't tell the difference. Um, and you know, a big part of my practice is, um, and this is a big part of my, uh, my, you know, if you want to call it a movement or whatever you, you want to call it, but I, I gather people and I just said, Hey, we don't have a hall, but let's just get together. Let's get an Airbnb and gather people and worship the gods together. Um, and we did that back in March. Um, we had a gathering of nine people in Kentucky. Um, and we actually have that in two weeks again, uh, for midsummer. And we're going to have a gathering of, uh, 25 people or uh, maybe 26 at this point. Um, and we're just all going to get together. I'm going to, you know, kind of get into this trance into sh- like this almost like shamanistic, you know, way. Um, and I'm leading these rituals now. And it's just, it's the craziest thing that a year ago, I, I just had a little bowl of uh, whiskey that I gave Odin. And now I'm leading these, you know, these groups and we're all giving the gods together. It's the wildest experience. Yeah. And it's fascinating to me too, because, you know, in my personal journey, I started out with Wicca when I was a young teen. And as I've entered my adult years, I found myself, um, like you starting to, I started to research my ancestry and, um, you know, found out that I was Danish mostly. (laughs) So I started getting into Norse paganism a few years ago and I've slowly started to make the transition from Wicca to Norse paganism. And I found that, you know, I'm not alone in this as I've gone through my own transition, that there are so many people right now who are fascinated by Norse paganism and that are really starting to get interested in this branch of paganism. So in your view, what do you think it is about Norse paganism specifically that's resonating with people so much right now? So yeah, what I think um, people are really attracted to in this faith is um, that that fellowship, that community. Because something that really bothered me, at least something that really uh, bothered me when I first got into this faith, is I live in an apartment building of 16 people. And I can't tell you one person's name. Same. Is, <laughs> I'm the exact like, same way. Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, it's awful. I mean, especially, you know, in the times we live in, you know, I got quarantined for a month and I really sat back and I'm like, I don't know anyone in here. Like this is, I mean, that's unheard of back, you know, a hundred years ago, everyone knew their neighbor, you know, everyone knew the story of every person on their street and we've lost that. And I think that's something we're really trying to regain with connecting to this old faith as these, you know, these old traditions. And while yes, the, you know, you know, the gods are wonderful, the folk are just as important. And I really think people are searching for that community that makes you feel like a family. Mm. Yeah, I really connect with that idea. And it's something that's very prominent in the Havamal itself. There's so many stanzas that are devoted to the concept of friendship and how to be a good host and, you know, how to find honorable friends, you know, and how to treat them well and the concept of gift giving. And they devote so much time to that. And you look at our own modern lives and you realize, wow, like us millennials, we suck when it comes to friendships (laughs) and building community. We're actually horrible at it. We're great online, but when it comes down to developing meaningful relationships, we really haven't valued that in our own lives. So I, I totally... If you leave the city, it changes. I would <laughs> I say <hope> so. <laughs> that 100%. Because everything you said would be true when I was in Chicago, but it's no longer true. So I've just got to say that. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely, you know, it's the weirdest thing. I, uh, I got into a conversation once with somebody. I'm like, rednecks make the most wonderful pagans. Or if they, if they finally committed to it, I'm like, they would love it. Like, you know, we're all about traditionalism and community. We love to drink. It's like, they would love this. <laughs> Dude, rednecks, like, if you listen to country music, it's like serenading the land. And it actually is also about, like, revelry, too, a lot. Yeah. Like, and, um, and when you, it's making me think, really, I was thinking about this today, too, because, you know, I live in the mountains now, and it's way different than living in the city and um yeah like the when you were talking about norse paganism having like a code of honor and like strictness in certain social things like that's still true in the strictness of like going to church and like being afraid of hell 
but there's still in the redneck world there's still like a lot of like pagan tendencies in a lot of ways especially from the animist point of view because people don't realize that country people are kind of animist that's a weird word to apply to them but it's kind of true Oh yeah, they would have no idea what you're talking about if you said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I get you because they are the only people that still hunt. Like people in the city, we couldn't grow a tomato if it, you know, if it meant, you know, keeping us alive. But you know, they can grow their own food. They can hunt. They can fish. They can skin an animal. They know where their food comes from, and that's something that we're losing real quick. And you know, and I, I don't want to be an apocalyptic person in a way, but if anything ever went bad, city people are done. <laughs> it's happening right now fyi yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i mean tell me about it so i live in chicago i've been in chicago for six years i'm not from chicago originally i'm originally from a more rural area in upstate new york and um yeah i definitely feel the urge to eventually return to a more smaller rural community over these past few years, and I, I'm i going to be moving to Texas briefly. <laughs> so <laughs> soon, in the, um, in the next couple of months, I'm going to be moving down to a suburb of Dallas. But my long-term goal beyond that is um, I do want to eventually have my own small homestead. I want chickens and goats and a garden. <laughs> and I've thought about this for many years because I've been a city dweller Um for about 10 years now and and I'm a bit older than you I'm I'm 31 so yeah. um so yeah it's something I've thought about and I've actually been looking at North Carolina as like a long term potential location um, I will say the east coast is looking very favorable for certain buildings one might call a hall mm-hmm. I can't confirm or deny locations but it's <laughs> looking like east, east coast <laughs> Well yeah North Carolina is really high on my list for you know a lot of reasons but um did you uh, this is really random but did you did you see the show hellier that sounds familiar yeah. what is that yeah i haven't heard that. I, I don't th- i think it was in kentucky it's like a uh, show on amazon prime um r- that involves the people that run the paranormal museum but it's like this crazy like appalachian um like rabbit hole of like paranormal stuff involving like <laughs> cave dwelling like goblin things but anyways oh, Appalachia gets real weird <laughs> yeah that's because f- you live in kentucky and that's what i was like i think it's hellier in it might be west virginia or kentucky but it, it made me think of kentucky because that's um that's an example of like the weird energy that's in those that part of the country i guess yeah but it's I also mean, beautiful too you know oh yeah i mean I really never respected until I started posting these videos. And it's like, to me, I just live here. And people are like, this is the most beautiful landscape I've ever seen. I'm like, oh, this is just my backyard. And I really didn't respect that. But the Appalachian mountain range and the forest around it are really, I mean, I think they're the oldest mountains in the world. It's just Mm -hmm. they've lost a lot of their height. And they're, I mean, they're so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I'll probably eventually move back down there. I was originally from Tennessee, from chattanooga <laughs> believe it or oh, not wow. well hey that, i mean it's absolutely gorgeous around chattanooga. <laughs> yeah right they got some good mountains down there so i think i'll eventually return down there but you know it is such a tough thing being a city pagan and i think dan experienced that which is why i moved down to colorado <laughs> to get near the mountains and snowboarding but um <laughs> but yeah you know i definitely find it very frustrating it's so much harder to connect with the gods especially the norse gods because where you connect with them is in these natural spaces like the forests. And um, that's, that's been tough well, for me over the past Chicago, few years. I mean, the Lake Michigan, I still, like after being away from the city and really deep into nature, I was even thinking about it today. I'm like, okay, yeah, Chicago's nature is still powerful to me in my, like it, it it's just hard to make time to make it a daily thing that you're exposed to unless you live really close to the lake or whatever. But um, I can't not give props to like the lakefront and the, the animist magic that's there. Oh, yeah, for sure. The spirit of Lake Michigan is is very strong. And unfortunately, during the lockdown, because we're still pretty much under lockdown here, 
um, they've closed down the whole lake shore That's right, and all yeah. the paths. So I haven't seen oh. the lake in I would like have three fucking got, months. I would have got the hell out of there. If the lake's gone, there, there's no <laughs> point. <laughs> I haven't seen the lake in three months and I'm like three blocks away because they've oh, closed I mean, all the block. They closed all yeah. the park access. So it's well, insane. And that's the thing. Like when, when I got, got on quarantine, I was like, great. I'm just going to hike every day. And then literally the next day they shut down all state, national and local parks. I'm like, Damn. what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, that was going to be it. That was all I did for like two months. Like, it, it was amazing. And I'm I'm really grateful I got to do it. But yeah, that sounds nice. <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, I'm not trying to rub it in. But I was, un- I was, I was unemployed and like, sleeping. I was in like depression mode, but like getting by okay. But it was, it was a crazy quarantine, not ideal. Even though I'm like, it was it was ideal for nature, but lots of uh, not fun being unemployed. I'll say that. Yeah, but to swing it back to Norse paganism, one thing I, I did experience while I was uh, on quarantine is I have a park that's like maybe it's like a five minute drive, but it's only a two hour walk. And I had this moment where I was like, I need to connect to the gods. I felt that urge to connect to Odin. And it's, it's one of my favorite videos now. I record the entire journey. I think it's uh, of someone by the All Father Spring 2020 uh, or April 2020. And while I was marching down there, um, I was going to give an offering of wine to the gods. And the weather completely changed. It downpoured on me. I mean, I was drenched. And I was like, no, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pushing to this tree I'm going to give this offering to. Um, and then soon as I gave the offering, the clouds parted, the sunset revealed itself, the sky turned pink, the wind started rushing and it's like, this is religion. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. When that stuff happens. Yeah. It really kind of brings to mind that sublime aspect of worshiping in nature, you know, which is like, in my view, obviously the best way to connect with deities is, is in nature. So that's pretty cool, though. I love that idea. Um, and I need well, to do even some- when in your story before, Jacob, when you were talking about like how hawks were flying near you and there are all these omens like that's that's what it looks like. That's what my experience has been like is when you're kind of in that like religious flow and then everything you look there's just like sign, 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 oh, yeah. sign. So, yeah. Um, so shifting it back a bit to you. Um, your YouTube channel, one of the things that really drew me towards your YouTube channel is your ability to kind of bring people together in the community. And I think that's something that the pagan community as a whole desperately needs. (laughs) I feel like we all need to come together because it's something we've talked about on this podcast for a while is that since I've been in the pagan community since I was a teenager, I've seen it kind of fall apart. Um, we used to have these kind of conventions, like, um, obviously there are local pagan prides, but there were like larger events as well. And most of those have been disbanded now. So I've seen kind of the pagan community devolve in a real world physical way. At the same time, it grew in popularity in an online way. And what I love about your channel is you're trying to bring it back to the, Let's physically meet, let's build a hall, let's have meetups, let's make it something real and not just online connections. So what has been your kind of experience with building or attempting to build a strong Norse pagan community? So when I first started the Wisdom Odin, which actually I believe is a year ago uh, next week, which is pretty amazing uh, that so much has happened in a year. Um, I did a lot of research. You know, I'm a media guy. Um, I I work as a media director um, for a car dealership. Um, I work, I'm a photographer. I'm a freelance videographer. So I really want to be, to dive into it and create the best, most well-produced, you know, pagan, you know, thing out there, pagan YouTube, pagan channel. And I found out that that wouldn't be very hard considering that no one ever does anything. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, like I, I watch all these people um, and they talk about giving offerings and I'm like, show me, you know, show me an offering, show me what you do. And, you know, and I won't, I won't name names on anyone, but it's like, no one was taking action. 
So I'm like, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show everything I do. And I had this agreement with the gods where it's like, look, I want this to be sacred, but I think it's my duty to show what I do in this religion. And that's, that's all I'm doing is just recording everything I do with this faith. And, and I still have my private moments. But I think when you show someone, hey, this is how you give offering, or hey, this is how I messed up giving offering. Like, you know, I'm not perfect. Um, because I think that's another thing that I realized um, when I first got into this faith is there's so much ego. And I think that's something that really brought it down is when you join these Facebook gro- groups, there's a clear hierarchy of people. Um, like you, you can't share ideas without being shot down or you can't make mistakes. Um, so I really wanted to make this environment where it's like, hey, let's try new things together. Here's me trying new things. I'm not perfect, but I'm doing it. And I want you to join me. Um, and I think that's really what people are taking to is that I'm not pretending to be perfect and I don't want anyone else to be perfect. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's something I haven't done much of. Like, I don't really show any rituals that I do because I do feel that kind of fear of, you know, the haters and the hate comments. So I kind of been keeping it separate myself and just focusing on education. But I think that's in a way what people really like about your YouTube channel is that you really show your offerings, you show your rituals, you show what it's like to give to the gods so people can kind of see what it's like in reality and and people are connecting to that so i think that's a great way to approach it and it's something that has definitely been been missing and i definitely agree with you that there's there's been a lot of you know it's it's fascinating when we look at the pagan community as a whole you know it really does seem like there's this huge division between the old guard and the new guard <laughs> Oh, yeah. in a lot of ways. And I don't want there to be a division. I really do respect what our elders have done to build a community. But at the same time, you know, there needs to be um, some changes, in my view, <laughs> to be made yeah. that can help bring us together. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I, I really like that about your YouTube channel. You actually like show <laughs> what it's like to give offerings. <laughs> yeah. when, when I was talking, I was like, okay, I know I don't think I've seen her give any offerings, so I don't want to make it seem like it's targeted towards her. Because no, trust me, there's way, there's way worse out there. <laughs> no, it's, it's totally true. I don't really show that stuff. Part of that's my own sanity. Like, I try and keep uh, my personal life separate from my YouTube channel. Um, because YouTube's, YouTube's a tough place. I'm sure you're oh, yeah. beginning to be Ooh. aware of. And it's especially tough as a woman. And, you know, there's only so many weird comments I can delete per day. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. My, my favorite thing is the hide from my channel forever button. I love that button. <laughs> I need to start implementing that, that button more. Because oh, yeah. it's been, it's been just pulling feel, me back I, from, from actually like showing stuff. Because I know like, oh, I'm just going to get so many weird comments if I actually like do a ritual online or people are going to think it's weird. So I should probably just like not do it. <laughs> well, I don't know. When I read like troll comments sometimes, even just like the the grammar and like seeing dumb people try to like talk shit, it just it like literally just makes you feel like so much more base and stupid and it's like it's it's crazy that, that there's that many stupid people out there oh yeah I, I was just clicking up my youtube to see if i got any stupid comments lately <laughs> um I, I had this one guy he's like have you told your mom yet i'm like no it would hurt her feelings and then every video i posted after that he's like at least i've told my mom at least i told my mom i'm like wh- why why do you care <laughs> jeez so um, one other thing that we were talking about, Jacob, is that you have a book coming out. So could you tell us a little bit about the book and what what to expect? Uh, yeah. So the contract is officially signed. So I can t- um, I'm really big on not talking about things until like there is physical proof that is happening. Like I have uh, so many projects that are working um, and this is one I'm so happy to finally talk about. Um, so I contacted Hugo and Moon and Publishing maybe six months ago. Um, and they're the ones behind the pocket have them all, which a lot of people have. Um, and I know they have a study have them all as well. And then just recently, a, uh, The Soul of the North, which I did a review on, came out through them. Um, and I've been talking to Carrie, the owner, for some time. And I was like, hey, I, I want to write a book and I want it to be community based. Um, and I finally came at her with this idea of why don't we have people share us their poems or write poems for the folk, for the gods. Um, and then we'll get this community book of poems together. 
and we'll just we'll just send it out. Um, and she loved the idea so much. She was like, let's do it twice a year. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I'll get starting on this, uh, started on this. So we, uh, we have a name. Um, I think I can say it. Um, it's going to be called The Folk Saga, uh, Tales from Across Midgard. Um, and I'm going to put out a video. Um, I think it'll be out by the time this podcast comes out on my YouTube channel. Um, basically calling for submissions. And, um, you know, we're going to try to get together probably, I would say, 60 poems. Um, from around the community. We're going to have it um, illustrated by the community, um, by our artist. Um, and we're going to try to produce this thing every six months. Um, and the proceeds are very small on it. Um, obviously, we really just want this to be a community thing. Um, but all proceeds on my end will go directly to hopefully uh, either funding bigger projects or building the hall itself. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I love the idea of making it a community thing where you know people can share their poetry mm -hmm. and and yeah, I love the idea too that it's like, you know, obviously we have the poetic edda, <laughs> but it's almost like a way to take that into our own hands and see what a modern 21st century poetic edda might be. <laughs> That's a yeah. really cool idea. If I have a, a thesis for wh what I'm trying to do, it's, it's create, you know, form our modern saga. Because while we can love the past so much, at the end of the day, we are the future of this faith. And it's like, we have to write our own stories. We have to, cre you know, create our own stories with the gods. Um, and I'm not saying that we need to completely change things. We don't change Odin's ravens to the eagles instead. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to record our stories so that future generations, 100 years from now, are hopefully reading about what we did. Because that's a really cool idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I really, I'm really excited for that book. <laughs> Can't wait to get it when it comes out. Um, yeah, hope, um, hopefully, if everything works together, I mean, it should come out pretty quick. I mean, because it, it, it being written by the community, um, I mean, honestly, I'm hoping February comes out is my hope. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so one of the things I know that you're really passionate about is building the hall. So why have you kind of focused on that idea and why do you feel like actual physical structures are so important for the Norse pagan community? Um, I feel like it's something that's important specifically in America, specifically in the North America, just because we're so large. Um, you know, a lot of people really fail to, to think about, but America is, I mean, it's really, it's one of the biggest countries on the earth. And we're also one of the most diverse. There's so many different ideas, cultures. Um, I mean, Chicago is so different from New York and Kentucky is so different from Colorado. Um, but I feel like if you have these physical structures that create a place, a create a sacred place where people from all across the country can come to, that's something special and it's something that we need. I mean, shoot, I, I got an Airbnb in Lancaster, Kentucky, and people are flying from California to get to this thing. I mean, someone's driving 16 hours to get to this gathering. And uh, I mean, that's, that's so powerful. And it shows that people in this country need this so much. Um, cause the hall was never my intention when I started this YouTube page. Um, it, it really came naturally when I realized that people need it and they want it so, so desperately. Yeah. It's one of those things. Um, cause I've, I've been thinking, I was thinking about it today. Um, th like in these rural communities, particularly like a lot of people go to church and just the way that a church is just, <sighs> Like each, each denomination is slightly different. And it's like, what do they, like, when you think about the Christian version of it, it's, it's like, well, this is really just about getting a bunch of community people in the same room for something. And I think so many people don't have any version of that without any religion. And then there's like all these different like flavors of Christianity that don't appeal to as many people now. So it seems like getting the group in meat space in real life together is way more valuable than like this fake virtual version of it. Yeah. Um, one thing that um, I, I'm becoming really attracted to is the fact that it's not an every Sunday thing. It's not an every town thing. Um, you know, I think in my opinion, I think there should be four gatherings a year. There's more holidays we can focus on and people are, I, I encourage people that in their local circles that they find to celebrate these, but I think as far as large scale, large production, I think four is great. And to me, that makes, excite it, makes it exciting. It makes it fun. It makes it a pilgrimage to get to these places. 
Um, and if you have them more scattered, it grabs, a, it's a larger net. So you get more, you know, just more fantastic ideas. I mean, I, I run a discord just with my Patreon. And I mean, we have people that blacksmith, um, you know, leather work, uh, paint, draw, do photography. We have a graphic designer now. And it's like, we have all these amazing creative people. And I mean, the sky's the limit, it seems like, on what we can do together. Yeah, when you were talking about like the different blacksmiths and artisans, you know, that are part of your community, it, in a way, it almost reminded me like a little bit of how much I love the Ren Fair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I look forward to the Ren Fair every year, ever since I was a child. And I would drive, you know, several hours to get to the Ren Fair because that was the one time that I could like connect with like a different world in a way, you know, like really kind of feel like I was transported back in time. And I just always really loved it. I'm sad that it's, you know, closed for this year because of the virus. But yeah, I hey, think the Kentucky, Hey, the Kentucky one's still going. <laughs> that's Go to the to Kentucky one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like that's, there's something really there about the idea of making a pilgrimage, you know, a few times a year to go to a place where you can really kind of separate yourself from your mundane reality, your normal life, your normal job, and just kind of experience something different for a while. Um, so I really do, I really do like that idea, and I think it's really powerful. And and I think you know you're going to have a lot of success with that, and and building these events, you know, as you move forward. One of the things I worry about, just because I've seen it in my own experience with you know attending different pagan groups over the years is that so often i feel like they fall into the trap of like gatekeeping and infighting and all of that kind of stuff and then they eventually just kind of disintegrate do you have any like strategies for how we in the norse pagan community can avoid the disintegration um, over time um, yeah, so this is something, again, I've had to naturally think about over time. Um, and I don't do this alone. You know, while I, I've become this face and a, and a, 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 a powerful voice and, you know, I, I can't hide from it anymore is that I'm, I'm such a, a, such a voice for so many people, but I don't do this alone. In fact, um, I, I, I won't say who it is yet, but someone else actually runs my Instagram account with me. Um, and so, you know, I have a, an inner circle that all, you know, anytime a decision comes up, we run this together. Um, we're all equals. And I, I say, I say to people all the time, I'm not your king, your Lord, your Messiah. I am one of you. And I just want to see this community grow and establishing again, that lack of ego, like leave no room for ego to grow. And I think that's where we will find success. Um, and I've actually at the moment, um, me and the, the people I work with, um, we've decided that we're not going to create a formal religion. Um, that's a question on a lot of people's minds. Are you going to become like the AFA or the, uh, the, uh, TAC? Um, you know, and I was like, I don't think so because that's not what this religion is. Cause if you actually look into what it takes to become an affiliated religion in the eyes of the government, you are no longer pagan. Um, because there's so many, you have to have bylaws, creeds, ways, to, ways to train clergy, ways to educate children. And these are all things that I like, they can be seen as important but they take away from what the true identity of this faith is. And it's a community folk religion. Um, so I think if we stay away from that and we, we totally get away from that concept, I think we remove the ego and we focus on a community built religion. And I think that's, what's going to keep it together. One thing that crossed my mind that I, just when you were talking about that. So just because Norse paganism and other types of paganism are more loose and without creeds and kind of more folky and natural and human. Like, could you ever see a situation where somebody could maybe be like um, a church going Christian, but then also a pagan, like casually on the side or something like that? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, I think it depends on who you ask. Um, I would say I will always keep my the, the doors of my hall open. Anyone is welcome to experience and you know and love our faith. But when it comes to those gatherings, you know, I I see those gatherings as people who really want to connect with the gods because that's such a strong energy connection between everyone. And if you have someone in there that's like kind of still on the you know like still Christian, but like just kind of wants to experience it, you throw that off. But it's like, look, these are for the folk. 
these these gatherings, these rituals are for us, but the hall will always be open. You know, come talk with us, experience our culture, play the games we create. You know, we're trying to create, you know, Viking games again um, and re- bring back the old ones. Um, and kind of like the Ren Fair, you know, we might have something like a Ren Fair to attract those people who are curious. But I think when it comes to like the sacred, you know, elements, those need to remain within the kindred and within the folk itself. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And it's such a hard, hard issue because so many people are right now starting to become interested in paganism. So they're like coming from a Christian perspective right now. And I get a, this question a lot, like, can I be a Christian and a pagan or can I be a Christian witch or all that kind of stuff? And it's like, part of me is like, well, technically you can because there's no rule books in paganism, but at the same time, it's such a huge shift in worldview that it's almost like impossible in practicality. <laughs> yeah. So I know, uh, I know Hilmar Hilmerson, uh, the leader of the Asatru in uh, Iceland, he said publicly that you can be a Christian and Asatru at the same time. And that's always been the thing I've always disagreed. <laughs> like, I just don't see how that can work. Like, if it works for someone, because I know Buddhism is very intermingle, it can intermingle with religions really well. Um, I know there are Christian Buddhists out there. I just, I don't know if it's going to work because you move from that worldview of the, you know, uh, the, the hierarchical structure of God, man, earth, you know, animals and, and animism. It's just, it's so different. I, if someone can make it work, go for it. But I don't think it's going to be something we, we necessarily focus on or encourage. Well, I mean, the reason I asked that question is because I'm like, well, on the one hand, there's so many people that are drawn to to religion and Christianity because of the structure and because they want some types of moral codes and stuff like that. Um, But that doesn't give you, in, in a lot of cases, I guess, it doesn't give you that like really mystical experience or spiritual experience. And I'm just wondering like, okay, well, if, like we were saying, if paganism could be sort of redneck adjacent, like could there be a situation where these more rural redneck types are like, well, I still like the, the sort of structured um, moralistic thing within Christianity or like structure, but then I'm also a human with ancestors and an animus, like the possibility to connect with animism, like, I'm just curious, like, because it it seems like people go, people choose Christianity because of the structure sometimes, and they could be missing out on, like, actual uh, mysticism, you know? Yeah, um, man, that's a hard question, and that's one of those questions where I feel like I can't speak for the community, um, and I don't know if I have a a solid answer for it, Um, but I have people that contact me, usually it's atheists. That are like, hey, I like the way the Vikings look. I like their culture. I like their symbols. Is it wrong for me to wear these symbols? Is it wrong for me to have a Thor's hammer? Um, and there's two sides to that. You know, one is I think you know if you're supporting it in any way, that's great. We need all the support we can get. Uh, you know, I think it's great that you know people want to you know relive the past. I think I think that can be good. But on the other side, we don't want it to become a fashion trend in a way where it's like you don't want to encourage everyone to, you know, to embrace it. I don't, like I said, it's very complicated. I can't speak on it. It's just, it's one of those things we'll have to figure out as we, as we move forward together. Yeah, definitely. And it is such a tricky, tricky thing because I feel like on the one hand, I don't want to discourage people from like experimenting with it, even if they're not ready to fully transition because, um, you know, we are still such a small community and I feel like, People, if they do kind of experiment with the idea, even if they're an atheist Norse pagan or a Christian Norse pagan, eventually it's either going to connect with them and they're going to fully shed their old beliefs or it's not. And then they're going to retreat back. Um, But it's still such a new concept, even though it's an old religion, it's still such a new concept to so many people that sometimes people need that weird transitional time because... I definitely had that when I was a teenager, when I was doing everything wrong. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Just kind of had to learn from my own mistakes. So it's so tough, though, because like you said, you know, you don't want to necessarily um, encourage people to wear the sacred symbols and to do the rituals if their heart and mind isn't in the right place. Um, But at the same time, we don't want to exactly discourage anyone either. 
Yeah. So it is such it's such a tough, you know, <laughs> tough thing to to think about. And, you know, with this kind of thing, there really aren't there aren't any governing bodies. There aren't any clear rules or definitions. And in part, that's what I think draws a lot of people towards paganism or Norse paganism. The f- mere fact that no one's telling them what to do. So, yeah. And, you know, it's one, it's one of those things like um, at my, ga- my gathering in the spring, you know, someone was like, hey, can I give an offering to a Celtic god? And I was like, I see no problem with it. You know, I don't have any problem with that at all. I think, you know, especially in paganism, we kind of have to accept that many gods exist because we're worshiping specifically gods in, a, in northern Europe. And so acknowledging, you know, African gods, acknowledging, you know, uh, Native American spirits and gods, I think that's really important to the faith. I don't think it's within our power or our right to deny other people the existence of other deities. Yeah, sometimes deities choose you as well. You know, like yeah. like you said, Odin kind of chose you. Um, we probably wouldn't be talking right now if that didn't happen. So <laughs> yeah, it there is you know like a a lot of crossovers between the overall sort of polytheistic or animistic point of view but um i think what you know if you're open to it if you're doing the right things if you're living the right type of life the gods kind of come to you sometimes yeah um i mean that's another really popular question people ask they're like hey i haven't heard the gods what's what am i doing wrong um and more often than not i'm like well who are you talking to and then they give me every single god in existence and i'm like okay you just need (laughs) just focus in you know why don't we just talk to thor today and see how that goes. Because I feel like, again, it's one of those things that there's no way, there's no structure to help. And, you know, they come to people, you know, those people come to someone like me or, you know, uh, my colleagues I work with, and they ask these questions. And it's, it's important for us to have very similar answers. Um, because things like that, it's a really simple fix. It's like, hey, why don't you just try to talk to Thor today? And then more often than not, the next day, they're like, wow, I talked to Thor, and a, a Thor and a thunderstorm appeared. And I'm fully, I'm fully in. And it's, you know, there's small things like that, that, you know, having a small form of structure, at least a, a, a collective idea will, will help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely like that. And, and paganism is one of those weird things where it's like, we want to bring in some structure, but we don't want as much structure necessarily. Yeah. As soon as the, people start saying bylaws and committees, I get like my skin crawls a little bit. My <laughs> eyes just like glaze over and I get bored. <laughs> so I'm like, I didn't become a pagan to like write stuff down oh, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. And that's, that's one thing that does separate us. And maybe that's in part why pagan communities have had so much difficulty in, and lasting is that, you know, traditionally they've been more structured with bylaws and committees and all of that kind of stuff that, that kind of takes away from the reason we're all pagan to begin with, which is that, intense visceral connection and belief with the gods that's why we're all here you know so we do need some organization but we don't want to forget why we all came here in the first place yeah so one of the last questions i had for you is where do you kind of see this community heading because norse paganism has gotten popular lately in part to a lot of the kind of popular culture stuff um, you know, like the TV shows and everything like that. Do you see it continuing as strong? Do you think that the momentum will continue to build? Do you have like a, a big vision for the future and where we're headed? So I have a huge vision, but at the same time, there's only so much I can talk about. Um, <laughs> so um, I think, I, you know, I was kind of having this moment last night. I'm like, why now? Why in the year, you know, in the, the early 2000s, is paganism returning? Um, why is it now that I get messages from people around the world that have heard the call of the old gods, which is powerful and it's amazing um, to hear all these stories um, of people that the gods are changing their lives. But I keep asking myself, why have the gods returned? Um, and I think it's just a combination of so many things. I think the world is in a very strange place. I think we can all agree on that. And I think that paganism in a way is becoming the answer. Um, you know, returning to nature, returning to fellowship and communi- community, um, and, you know, the idea of sacredness, you know, right now, nothing is sacred, it seems, anymore. Um, so in a way, paganism is becoming this counterculture movement. 
um, in, a, in a, such a, such a weird way. Um, and I keep, you know, paganism is a lot of places to go. I think we have a lot of hard fights ahead of us. Um, we have a, we have an uphill battle all the way, which is why you need to watch, uh, listen and watch the new war Druna song because it's all about climbing a mountain. <laughs> um, and to me, what I see, I want to bring our media back to us. I mean, Vikings TV show was great. I think Last Kingdom was great. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more video games pop up. You know, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you know, is coming out. Hellblade was very successful. Um, we're seeing more music pop up. Um, you know, bands like uh, Osai and the Jupiter and, of course, High Lung. Um, we're seeing a revolution in, you know, the, the future of this faith. And I think it is because of the internet and because of the modern age. Um, which in some ways has held us back as a society. But for, for paganism, I feel like it's helping us so much. And if we really learn how to harness um, media um, and media outlets, I think that is how we're going to bring the community together. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great vision. And um, I agree that the gods return during apocalyptic times. I mean, even... Um, even in the book of revelation, there are lots, there's a cast of characters and, um, the veil is thinner and truth is being revealed. And, you know, if the gods are a part of our lineage, then, you know, when everything is revealed that, that the truth of their existence is also revealed too. So. Yeah. Um, I think, um, one of the more powerful lines or quotes I've heard from Hemwar Hemwarson is someone asked him this very question of why have the gods returned? Um, and he quite simply says, because we need them again and they need us. Um, because for a long time, I mean, the reason that the Vikings, you know, cast aside their beliefs is because they no longer needed the, the folk religion. Um, and, you know, we're learning now a thousand years later, like you said, you know, you know, this, this end time, like, I don't want to say in time, like the world's going to end, but the world as we know it is changing. And I, I feel like it's changing back towards the, the folk religions, back towards paganism. Yeah, I definitely feel that calling too. And I hope that's where we're headed. I mean, in a way, that's just like so exciting <laughs> to be oh, yeah. part of that and to be part of the pagan community right now as it's going through this huge surge of interest is so wonderful. And thankfully, with the internet, we have this platform, whether it's through, you know, your YouTube channel or my podcast or anything like that, we're able to connect with so many people and share our own experiences with the old ways and the old gods. And other people are resonating with that and, and sharing their own stories with the gods as well. So it's such a fascinating time to be alive. And I'm really grateful that you're part of this community and, and sharing this message and continuing on this path and helping bringing more people towards it. So um, yeah, I think that's a, a good spot to, to end our chat on. And is there um, anything last things you wanted to mention and where can our listeners find you? Um, so first off, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I was so excited. Um, I think this is the second podcast I've been on, um, just overall and they're so much fun. I love them. You know, they're, they're casual in a way, but there's a great way to get a message out. Um, so thank you so much for having me, uh, both of you. Um, but if I have any final comments, it's, uh, <laughs> it, I, I've been brought up that I'm really good at, at teasing people <laughs> with all, you know, cause I, I produce my own trailers. Um, you know, I, I'm very ambiguous with like projects I'm working on. But I cannot tell you how many cool and exciting projects I'm working on. I can't get into details. Like the book project was one of them. I'm so glad I can talk about it now. But there are some some really exciting things coming, um, and I can't wait to share them with people. Um, but if you want to learn more about these projects, um, I'm on Instagram, The Wisdom of Odin. Um, YouTube is you know uh, my main my main hub, uh, which is The Wisdom of Odin. Um, and if you ever want to support the hall, I have a Patreon, but I, I don't like talking about that often. <laughs> Nice. Well, yeah, that's that's great that you have these projects coming and I get it. You don't want to jinx yourself or, you know, have your foot in your mouth. Look, um, the last time I talked about something openly, we had this little thing called COVID happen. It kind of ruined a lot of things. Oh, so yeah. I'm, tra I'm trying not to spawn another plague. <laughs> I'm, sh I'm sure you're not alone in talking about something and then COVID wrecked it. So don't feel bad. <laughs> All I'll say is I had a documentary planned in Iceland and it ruined everything. Oh no. That would have been so cool. <laughs> oh, I cried. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> well, what a, well, 
Maybe next year. I don't want to say whatever, but you know, like uh, you're not alone. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I know. We'll get through this though, and we'll we'll come out a bright, shining pagan world. And yeah. Well, thanks again, Jacob, for coming on the show. This is really fun to talk about. And for our listeners, definitely check out his YouTube channel, The Wisdom of Odin. Um, So, yeah, thanks again, Jacob. So thanks for listening to our interview, guys. Um, We want to wish you all the best for the upcoming week and watch out for that summer solstice energy and that eclipse energy. And thanks again for listening today. And of course, we would love to um, have you reach out to us on Instagram. We want to hear how the card of the week or the astrology is affecting you. So you can find us on Instagram at cosmic underscore keys underscore podcast. Yes, definitely check us out on Instagram. And we're also on Twitter at cosmic keys 777. Um, And we, we have been loving the reviews we've been getting on iTunes. We got a couple this week that were really, you know, made us feel like our work is worthwhile. And believe it or not, Scarlett and I are planning ahead to make the show even better and adding more variety and options and fun stuff for our patrons and our free audience as well. So if you like the show, you can support us on Patreon patreon.com slash cosmic keys you get episode extensions plus full forecasts for the week ahead and keep writing those reviews guys we we love it inspires us to give you an even better show when we get those reviews so much appreciated to everyone that put them in this week and until we talk to you next week have a great week